name is Nancy Field Stewart, and as they know, she her pronouns, and I am one of the facilitators of MCC's Talk Back team. Um, so I want to first thank you all so much for coming out to this conversation, to this um, conversation with these amazing artists today. Um, MCC's mission is to provoke conversations, and this is part of our Let's Talk series, which is dedicated to having conversations that provoke other conversations, but more conversations, and on and on we go. Um, so, once again, I want to thank you all for coming. I also want to take a moment uh, for a land acknowledgement. For those who aren't familiar, this is just a procedure or process to acknowledge the land that we are on that has been stolen from indigenous and native people. Um, we are on the land of the, the, the Lenape people. Thank you. Uh, and these are people who exist today and deserve our recognition and our celebration and acknowledgement. I also, within that land acknowledgement, want to acknowledge the continued gentrification that occurs in New York City that pushes black and brown people out as well. So if we can all just take a deep breath in and a breath out to remember the land that we are on and to be grateful for it. So thank you all so much for coming today. I think that I said everything I need to. Oh, I will say one last little bit of business is that um, this is the show that Wrong Man is happening in. Let's give a shout out to this amazing set. the lobby. We have Seared by our two that are back. Um, so make sure, I'll oh, give that a copy of All right, and so with that, I'm going to bring out Amber Gray. I 
splint. I had like a sling for a while, and my head was swollen and bruised, and there I was with my fan. <laughs> 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 And Rachel, as you start off last, we're going to start with you now. Um, so you, uh, you are currently performing in a glorious rendition of Hades Town on the Broadway. Yeah. Eight Tony Awards, correct? Casually, eight Tony Awards after the show. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, casually, just like whatever. It's no big deal. It's like you get to hang out with all these cool people. Um, so um, you were with, but you've been with the show since. 2016 in the off Broadway production at 14. 14. <laughs> Ooh, girl, let me tell you something. Wikipedia lied to me. Where are you doing, girl? What did you think? What, what was the show before that? Because I, I know that the 2016 was in New York Theater Workshop, right? Right. When I say I've been with it since 2014, that's when I did my first workshop. Mm -hmm. That was a two week workshop that we did up at Dartmouth. So I've done six two week workshops, and this is my fourth full production of it. Amazing. Yeah. So, so part of my part of my question is, I think that as like actors and performers, there's sort of the pressure of like you know what comes next after the show ends, right? And so that's a lot of like, you know, and then there's there's you know there's the post show depression that you go through, like oh I just spent all this time creating with all these amazing people, and now they're not in my life anymore, um, or just they, like they are, but just not in the not in the same frequency. And so I feel like actors, uh, actors and performers often experience that pressure like, in between shows of like, what's coming next, what's coming next. And so we'll sometimes say no to projects that have like, asked us back because it's like we have something that's solid. Um, but to be that dedicated to a show since 2014, like, what sort of was that process for you of making the choice that Hades Town was a show that you were going to stay yoked to for this long period of time? I have to say, I graduated from school in 2010, so I basically spent the last like, decade working on maybe five shows. And those five shows have all re-upped multiple times. Like I kind of, I'm very loyal to projects once I get attached to them. And that's just how long it takes. It takes three, four, five years. And it only this year was my first time ever having to like say goodbye to one where they kind of came up at the same time. It has magically aligned that I will like leave your theater workshop case down for a little bit to like go be back in Great Comet again. You know, and uh, I sort of love that about new works is that it takes time, and uh, you get to do many iterations of them and keep coming back, because theater is like, it's messy, you know, and there's a lot, uh, many, many phases to making something new. It's cool to come back and, like, to leave a project for a while and let it marinate and know that you get to come back to it in nine months mm -hmm. is very special. I'm grateful that I have that. Uh, yeah, that's so, that's so amazing. Did, did you ever feel any sort of, like, of that pressure, like does it, it, I mean you're saying it happens pretty seamlessly, which is, that sounds incredible. It has happened seamlessly, it's starting not to, which is great, because it means there's lots going on, but um, I, I just love new works, and I love, I kind of say yes to lots of readings and workshops, and I will always say yes to that stuff, because I like getting in at the ground level, and then you have a huge hand in making the thing, which is very special. Love that, thank you. Uh, Ross, I'm going to pass it over to you now. Um, so, you casually dropped Ariana and Loretta and Vicky. Um, but, like, you know, I mean, you, you have like, worked with a lot of like, these very big, like, you're not hurting in the music industry, you know? You, you've met some people, you've talked to some people, it's been nice. So, what, but, this is, um, but this is now, you know, this is your first musical, am I correct? And it started out as a concept album. Also, applause for a first new musical, hello. So, for, for you, um, what kind of was that journey going from this very like uh, mainstream pop realm and music industry in, into taking like something that is like, you know, we can create individual moments, individual like songs, and then taking all that and forming it into a full narrative? What were some of the challenges and joys of that? What's weird about the journey for me is that uh, the, the wrong man way precedes any of the hit songs. I started writing most of the wrong men when I was really broke in an apartment and no one would listen to any song I wrote. And I was in bands and I re released music, signed to major labels, and still sold no records. And no one wanted it. I, I couldn't give away music. So when I was writing the wrong men, it was once I got to a point where people started saying, hey, will you play this for my friends? Will you play it for my dinner party? You know, and this person's sometimes wealthy house where you're all of a sudden I've seen the other side and they said well, by 2010 I started I had you know 30 minutes of it done 
which of course none of those songs are in this version. But um, a couple of songs are. But but the the gist of it was that people were so into just being entertained for 35 minutes or 40 minutes, and I started playing it regularly in these living rooms and in these kitchens and lofts and offices. And these people would say, why don't you come and write with my artist? Why don't you come write with my producer? Why don't you come, you know, you gotta play this for, you know, I'm literally down the hall from some icon kind of artist, and everyone would say, like, hey, you gotta come to the studio real quick and play it for, you name it. So, you know, the people who I've been friends with who are now really successful artists and you know them by name and all this stuff, we were all really broke. <laughs> We were just young and scrappy. And the mistake I think people think is when they say, oh, they're a struggling musician. In reality, it was just a musician. And just going through the journey of, of that. But by the time I did one version of this on stage alone with a guitar, I had sold, you know, maybe 10 million songs for other artists. And then that was before I had any hit hits. And then all of a sudden, all the hits started coming in, and then people said, hey, what about that wrong man thing that you were doing? So me coming back here, a lot of people have this idea that I was writing songs for other people, and I said, oh, I'm gonna write a musical. No, all of those songs for the other people happened because of the wrong man. I've been a, a, a theater kid since I was a little kid. I've been, I was in theater growing up. I just got, a, you know, I looked for schools for theater and they'd offer me music scholarships. So I went and did music instead. But I always, my heart was here. So it's a new musical to everyone else, but you know, how many of you have relationships that have lasted for 14 years? <laughs> you know? And you know, my, my, one of my best friends is the lead of this show, Duran. You know, it's being performed by one of the most genuine, honest, wonderful people in, on the planet. He's brilliant. You know, Josh Henry's been there from the get-go. He's he's so good, and he's bringing to life my friend. But I I don't see this as that you know, all the success from the songwriting stuff. It's just opening doors for something I've been working on for my most of my adult life. Thank you so much for that. Uh, just, I, I like, as a moderator, I like to be like, okay, let's look at the common themes. Like, I'm seeing, like, some dedication, some, like, staying committed and loyal to projects, as well as, like, some, like, just keeping at it, keeping it going, recognizing where you come from, loving that. Just putting it out for the audience. Okay, great. Great. I'm going to hand it over to you now, because you are, um, you have an incredible show at, well, at LC, that was commissioned by Institute 3 in the Green. And you also are currently performing in Cyrano at Signature, and also we're casually on this stage in Alice by Heart, and we're phenomenal. If you didn't see it, give class to all of you. Certain songs, like, ooh, she went up there. I was like, oh, so, yes, we love to see it. We love to see it. Um, so, uh, so I think that my question for you is kind of, you know, as a, as someone who is achieving success or achieving recognition and achieving like space for your writing and your acting to occur simultaneously. Um, how are you sort of navigating that? Does that do you find that like as a writer you sometimes have to work extra hard to be taken seriously because you are also a working actress? Do you find that as an actress, you know, you are sometimes having to work extra hard as a writer? Because I think that often, you know, the in industry, the musical theater industry can, and any industry really wants you to kind of be one particular thing because it's easier to market you that way. Do you feel that pressure? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I don't want to do just one thing. And I haven't had to make a decision yet. So I'm going to keep writing it out. And you know, just, uh, <laughs> um, the, the show that I wrote um, that went up at, at LCTV this past summer, that's, that's the first, like, that I've, heard. And I've had a band and I've been writing things. I've been writing things, you know, uh, for the band with a narrative that's like three to five minutes, and I've never written anything that was ninety plus. But I had been uh, that that like, that was a, an old old passion project for me as well. I've been working on that for a long time. I, I came to it because I studied medieval art in college and just liked that. I didn't know what that was going to be. That wasn't the thing I was supposed to be focusing on, but I liked it, so I wanted to study it. And 
and then if I came to discover this amazing historical figure um, in, in Hildegard von Bingen, and I was just like, who is that? I think I just have to, it just started as me just responding to this inspirational person, and many, many years of that, of just trudging around and trying to find out what this thing was until many, seven years later, it, it crystallized into a show, which is um, absolutely the hardest thing I've ever done, and also the most rewarding. And, and book it, you know, I started the year here at MCC doing Alice by Heart, and then the year doing enough somebody else's show somewhere else, and um, um, it's been really valuable to be able to be on both sides of that table. Oh my gosh, you learned so much, my friends. Um, and I'll say, I don't know if this is the, am I answering your question, but if it's where am I answering? The, I want to just say that something that I learned that I'm so grateful for by being on the other side of that table as tour, as, um, as a writer and as a creator, was really to just see like the community that comes together to make your little seed of a baby idea come to life. It's just incredible. And you know what, I've, I've, I'm usually a part of that community in like, I'm a cog in somebody else's wheel and I'm happy to be that cog I love figuring out how the wheels turn. But to have like your own kind of wheel and to figure out how to put those things together and there are other people who show up to make that thing happen, it's, uh, being an artist is really fucking weird and hard and cool. <laughs> um, yeah, and uh, now that there has been like, I had a thing that I wrote in it, people did it, other people came and saw it, and that was great. Um, now there, there are like other opportunities coming up and uh, like for instance, in, in the next couple of months, I like turned down an opportunity for for a job because there's this like two week period of time, like time becomes really really important, where I get to go away and work on writing something, and that feels really valuable to me. That I'm not getting paid for that the job, but I'm paying something to be the cog in somebody else's wheel. But the time away to work on something new that sort of outweighed the paycheck for this other thing, and so like that's the thing that's starting to be negotiated is what, how do I want to be spending my time? Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's becoming not necessarily so much about like getting jobs, but like the quality of jobs and um, the, yeah, having the time to make and know what, what feels valuable to me. Yeah, I think that's so, yeah, but that's so much. That's just so much of like what we I can crave for as as artists and creators in general is like the time where we where we stop having to where we start being able to determine the value of our time not just by what it, by how much money we're getting out of it but by like how we are spending our time so I really appreciate that that's such a like privilege and a joy to reach I feel like as an artist and congratulations on that that, that in and of itself is a joy and humble burden. <laughs> Alright, now I turn to this one, Michael R. Jackson of a strange shoe. Um, so you did this little show, like it's incredible. If you have not bought the album, then what are you doing? <laughs> I personally am trying to make sure that it comes another one of the titles, so everyone else needs to help me to get like all the other things. So a strange loop, incredible, it's so amazing. Um, I think that this, like, a strange loop in particular, um, I feel like it's part of the category of shows. If it, if it could have a category, I would say that it's part of the category of shows that is often labeled as like unapologetic or unapologetically black or unapologetic in its portrayal of X, Y, Z. And I'm sort of wondering, you know, how you as a black queer artist are navigating, or just as a person, if not to take away those things because they all exist in one, but how you are navigating sort of uh, the label of unapologetic. Do you do you navigate at all? Does it feel important to you? Does it inform anything in any way for you? Like that that word unapologetic. And that's a word that I'm placing on it, but I feel like I feel like I can helpfully say that about that piece. Um yeah, I for me sometimes it feels like putting those kind of labels on, I'm not saying you're doing that, but like sometimes it feels like putting a label like that on a strange loop suggests that like I sort of was out to get somebody or like to sort of like assert uh, a kind of authority around my, around my experience when truly it was just like this piece began unbeknownst to me 18 years ago as just a monologue that I wrote for myself when I was like 
you know, about to graduate from undergrad and just feeling like a lot of sort of anxiety and confusion about what was going to happen next in my life and sort of what, what it felt like to be like a young black gay man at that time. And so it, like the unapologeticness of it was just the fact that like I had to get something out. I need to take something that was like un intangible and try to make it tangible. And so I just wanted to give a shape to a feeling. Um, and so it just, so like, it's unapologetic in that respect because I wasn't, you know, I had no goals with it. And so it just was what it was. And so like that, I, that for me is like the, the best way I can describe it. Yeah, well, so I think that part of, part of the reason I specifically use that word is that I think that often shows the, the suggestion of that is that there is something to apologize for, you right. know? And so I think that it's, in, I, I think that's part of also in my question that, that sort of, is there ever, is there ever this feeling of this pressure? And I'm probably word it well enough, but like, is there ever this feeling of this pressure that like, there is something about your work that you should be apologizing for? Oh, uh, well, <laughs> um, I will say that like, also like, so that monologue happened, I was an undergrad studying playwright at NYU. I had no design about being a composer. I was not writing music at that time. That was just like another thing that happened later, sort of by accident when I went to grad school. But the thing that like I found was once I did start writing music and writing songs, like a lot of those songs just like the monologue ended up being like very personal and like and I, you know, have always been sort of like for me, I'm in the vein of like the songwriters who I loved as a teenager, which was like Tori Amos was like she was like my number one person. And so like a lot of people who know her work know that she's sort of always been labeled sort of confessional or like and very honest and that sort of thing. And that was just that quality of her work was something that I took on in my own work, or tried to. And, and sometimes, like, when it, I started sharing that music with people, for the most part, people were, like, appreciated that. But then sometimes, like, I had a hard time, you know, when I started putting concerts up and stuff in the early days of my career, where, like, people were, there were the actors, frankly, who would, like, I'm not singing that. You can't say that word. Let me, like, all this, like, push back and push back and, and what's wrong with you, and how dare you, and I can't say that, and I can't offend Chelsea, and all these things, you know? And like, um, seriously, like that literally was like an email to me where someone like, which were from a concert of mine, it was probably because they were afraid that like, Chelsea wasn't gonna like a song. Anyway. And so like, it, it was hard for me just because I'm like, I'm just trying to, to push the form. And like, and, and like, and, I, and I'm not doing something that's just usual, you know, like I'm gonna like take risks in my work. And so it was hard early on because I, sometimes I just felt like people thought that I was just trying to not make people have a good time. But like truly all I want is for like people to have a good time and like things I write. I mean, there's often gonna be a cost for that good time, but like, <laughs> <laughs> but like at the end of the day, like I'm not like, I remember I worked on this musical once for the director. We were trying to figure out how to do the, um, the curtain call, and she said, I don't want to do one that's super arty and mean. And I feel like I'm not a super arty and mean person. I'm just super arty, I'm not mean. <laughs> so, so, like, it was hard in the early days when, like, I sometimes felt like there was, like, a certain section of, like, New York theater people who were like, what's wrong with you? you, you Juvenile delinquents, you know, and I'm like, that was the word, you know, <laughs> and like, and like, I just had to find my tribe of people who were interested in like taking the journey and the risk with me. And once like I found those people, and just and I kept doing what I was doing. Yeah. Like, other everybody else sort of came along later. It just took a while. Well, I I must say that I personally want to thank you for putting uh, Morgan Lee into on a black trans woman on stage, center stage, as what you said in a gorgeous dress. <laughs> I, that the show means a lot to me. All all of your work is so incredible and means so much to me. But I do want to specifically thank you um, for taking the time and the attention because I think that if we're talking about contemporary musical theater, it is necessary to bring up the fact that you know this role wasn't originally written for you know. 
for Ellen Morgan, and Ellen Morgan is the genius that she is, and that's what brought and that's what brought that piece forward and has changed it and magnified it in so many ways. That's, that's so I want to thank you for placing a black trans woman center stage for a moment that we deserve and that we should have more of. So thank you for that. Um, <laughs> all right, this is the number I look all of you, and you need to raise your hands. And I will point it to you, and then you will ask questions of these lovely individuals. Keep it cute. <laughs> Keep it cute. All right. Um, Anyone have a question at all? If you don't, yes. Amber, since you've been doing your show for such a long time, how do you keep it fresh? How do you, keep, you know? How do you keep it fresh, Amber? As a performer, I've just been in a show for so long. How do you keep that word fresh? Training. <laughs> I am over trained. I, um, I, I am a very technical actor. And I think about training all the time on stage. And it just helps you repeat repeat, repeat, and I find it deeply satisfying to repeat and do something for a year. It is a form of insanity to do something so minute over and over again, and it's really fun. And then after three months, you short circuit, and you have panic attacks, and you're like, I don't know the words, I don't know the notes, I'm on the trick. And then you do, because you're going to think about what flight you're going to take off. <laughs> and then you go through that phase for like a few weeks, and the company tends to go through it together, which is really fun. And then, um, and then you go deeper, which is rad. And I find by the time I do long runs, like by the time that year, like this year on Broadway, for example, by the time my year is up, there will be things that are obvious to me in that final month that should have been obvious back in 2014. That's like the beauty of living in a role for so long. I love that. Yeah. It's very fun. And I've been in a lot of like freak projects that are slightly immersive. So it is truly different every night where I'm like, okay. <laughs> you want to like, I don't know. They, you know, it's just different every time. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Hi, uh, my name is Almok. I study musical theater in Amda. And we're being taught that acting should be very truthful and honest. And a lot of your work is larger than life and things that sometimes, well, we don't see in day to day life. We don't see Hades walking around. So, how do you keep your work still connected to that? honest person to person. I think, this is a, this is, I think this is a question also for writers as well as yes. um, performers. So how do you as a performer have, uh, how, how do you, what do you, what do you kind of, are there, what techniques, what techniques do you use to connect, you know, with something like Hades walking around with reality? And then as writers kind of, um, and performers actually, uh, how are you, how are you navigating the space of like, you know, taking what makes it larger and the money kind of making it very specific. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um I think I think like it's all real life. Hades is real. And so you just have to you just have to find that like in you. And you have to like understand the stakes of of what what that larger than life thing is and observe the, the reality of that and, and like and follow whatever the conflict is or the character's desires to to, to, the, to all the way to the fullest extent that it can go in the story. So like to me it's all it's all reality. Like there's no I don't make a distinction like this is real life and that's not real life. Yeah. Like I, I just sort of it's all one to me. Yes, I agree. I want to say something about the me. <laughs>
And that was a weird thing to ask my actors to do. But like, I had great actors who figured that out. And that felt like the right theatrical way to tell that truth. The end. Yeah. yeah. You know, when Michael was talking about pushing the form, it yeah. doesn't mean that you're not respectful of the past and where it comes from. But you can still, you know, that question of what is a musical is such a short question. And one of the one of the jokes that we've had around here is that a short note is, is not the same thing as a small note. So if somebody, you know, that, that's a very short question of what's a musical, but you could write dissertations on is it the form? Is it that rhymes have to be, you know, exact? You know, um, you know, Jagged Little Pill is not going to be one rhyme that's the same if you know the album. You know, does that mean that it's not musical theater? Probably it's musical theater because it's not mm, our job as an audience necessarily to define it, but to, to be there in the moment and to enjoy it. And it takes a lot of empathy for an audience to enjoy new works and to enjoy new musicals so that they can evolve their definition of what a musical is. Because what all of us write and what all of us are performing is not something that's already existed on stage or none of us would be on this stage. Right. I think there's also, in, in, the, in common threads that I see in a lot of your work, whether it be as performers or as like writers, there is sort of this joy that, you know, theater is make-believe. We are playing, we are playing professional make-believe and we get to be paid for it, you know? We're writing professional make-believe and we get to be paid for it. And so I think there is a joy to sort of um, extending our imaginations and what that does is we like, as we announce the possibilities, like, what does it look like for, you know, when you used to come out of the to tell you that you're not like the right kind of black person? Like, what, what does that, what does that really look like? You know, what is it like to take care of our story and expand and like, to expand into three people? What, what do these things look like and how do we push the media? And it's through extending that imagination. It's so beautiful and exciting to have you all today to talk about that. Yeah. Um, I think there was someone right behind you. Yes. Was that true? Yes. Um, so I have a question for Grace. I really loved In the Green. And I was kind of wondering what it was, how you took something that no one really knew anything about and put it on stage and told a story about it while still trying to stay truthful to who Hildegard was. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a good question. Um, because we should know who this woman is. Her name is Hildegard She is freaking cool. Uh, she's a very powerful 12th century figure who is on par with like Galileo and Da Vinci, and she's a woman, so. <laughs> to know her name. Um, but yeah, I, I ask that question of myself a lot because there have been other things. Like, there's a movie that came in a German film in 2012 I recommend it's called Vision about her life. Great, cool. There are other people who have felt like me who are like weird little casual medievalists who have been like, this lady's cool. How can I embody her and tell her story? But it's really like only other people like me who will go and seek those things out. It's like, who, nobody else is really. The question was, how do I take this thing that I think is really cool and is like kind of niche and make it accessible to a modern audience. And so that that kept taking me to a you know a, a personal place of like what is it about this person that I today in 2012 when I started working on it um, that I uh, respond to about her. And so it just like I wanted to take it back to the beginning. Like yes she lived as a huge, amazing life, but I decided to talk about the very beginning of her life, the origin story, because I think that when we go to the beginning, like that can make a, a, a character or a story accessible to us. Um, and I wanted to talk about her trauma, because I think that um, she uh, was a person who was able to take her trauma and like, transform it into something very powerful, and I think that that's uh, an important story to tell. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, I'm, yeah. um, I'm just curious about how you decide or discern which stories deserve your voice. Because it seems like everybody has like so many things that they want to tell and there are so many stories that you could lend your voice to. And like, how do you decide which one gets it? I was going to ask you, because you were saying that you, that you like the worst when they you know, you get excited about it. Yeah. Um, 
you know, you get offered roles of things that have already gone through development. Mm -hmm. Why, why take the risk? Why do the, why do the? It, it's a low floor, high ceiling risk when you find when it's a new work. So why do you choose? How do you? How do you choose the language of the book? I guess both. I mean, it's, I, mean I don't know if this is a different like question than why do you choose? Yeah. I don't like like this anymore. I used to when I was a teenager. You know what I mean? But to me, getting in on the ground floor, acting wise, is right. Like I made Persephone in Hades Town. You know. <laughs> <laughs> And I, I find that deeply, deeply creative, interpreting, yes, other people's words, but a lot of that stuff came out of my weird brain. And so it is very creative when you get on the ground floor. I find when something is a classic, there tends to be a little more of like a preconceived notion of what it needs to be. There's like a right and a wrong, which I resent. And that's just me, especially as a mixed girl, that makes me fall into like a weird place sometimes. And that has been my history, so I just, Start gravitating towards new work, and that has just now turned into my bread and butter, and I'm like here to stay. Maybe one day I'll be in one of the four checkoffs, which I look forward to. I don't really care about a lot of classics anymore because I want new stories being told. I want to see them working. You know what I mean? I want like I yeah, that turns me on um, as an artist. And like, if you do it right, you don't ever have to retire from this career. I'm gonna be like Andre de Shield sneaking across the stage. <laughs>
someone that's not necessarily exactly my background or whatever, there's still like an energy, there might be an energy inside of them and their story that feels very similar to my something inside of me. And like as a writer, I get to sort of transmogrify myself in a way to sort of like deal with some other thing that may, that like feels analogous to me, like in my own life. And so like, I, I sort of like, that's how I find my way into the stories that I want to tell. Because like often, because most of the time, those stories are like things that like, won't leave me alone. And so I just have to keep, I just have to keep after it. Mm -hmm. And like, and, that, and that's how I know, whereas like there might be other stories where like, like I, where I just can't find the sort of energy connection. And, and there's like, I'm not that interested in sort of telling the story. There's something that you're saying that I can respond to, and I just want to say that it's kind of like an exorcism. Right. Do you know what I'm saying? Like sometimes there's a thing that just like won't leave you alone, and the only way you can deal with it is to like make something. And it feels like, God, there's like this weird uh, demon possession that you can feel it. <laughs> Well, on that daily possession note, I'm afraid that we reached the end of our time. But, um, <laughs> but um, thank you all for coming out tonight. Thank you to these incredible panels. Please make sure you're in the lobby, you're talking to all the people. Get your tickets for Seer, get your tickets for Romance, get your tickets for Cyrano, Hayes Town, and for whatever Michael Jackson or Jackson is cooking up next, which I know will be amazing as well. Actually, you can definitely do. You can go on and you can buy a Strangely Cast album. <laughs> <laughs>